day. Hey, it's uh, Benjamin Ray here, and I have Samantha from Perennial Brands. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Ben? Doing great. Thanks for coming on today. So we were just talking a little bit about kind of your your path and how you got to where you are now. So if you could explain a little bit about Perennial Brands and kind of the parent company around that, and then your path from where you started and where you are today. Absolutely. So it's quite a funny path on behalf of where I started. So it'll be a fun story. Um, but we'll start with Perennial Brands. So Perennial Brands is basically a startup within a larger company called Perennial Inc. And Perennial Inc. does everything from brand strategy to execution, in-store design, any type of marketing from ideation to production um, for pretty much any business. So we've worked with companies like Coca-Cola, we've worked with Loblaws, and we currently work with RBC as well. So since Perennial, having such a strong backbone uh, with all of this marketing insight, we decided to create Perennial Brands, which is basically, you know, we're helping out all these brands with every marketing aspect that they need. So why don't we create our own brands using our expertise and really just focusing on innovation and creating products that are great quality and creating them quickly. So, so that's where it's not necessarily at all in the in the, it's not all beauty products. So it no, it's not. So perennial brands focuses on three main sectors. So we focus on alcohol, cannabis, and energy. So like energy pills and caffeine. Um, with our alcohol here in Canada, from ideation to launch, it's about a year and a half. We currently have three products in the market in Canada. So we have two. Uh, so we have one alcohol that's 18.8% vodka. Um, so it's a low calorie, low alcohol vodka. That's basically just for consumers that want to be a little bit more conscious of their alcohol intake, really a little bit more responsible. We have an 18.8 gin. And then we just recently launched a whiskey in the Canadian market as well. Hmm. So that's our alcohol insight for our cannabis businesses. We run a couple different ones that are all in the works right now. The one that I focus on mainly is our cannabis topical business. Um, so it's really just talking about responsible manufacturing, responsible practices, and really making cannabis approachable for consumers that may not be uh, vested in the category as of yet. So we're really focused on having a really trustworthy and responsible stance. And then we work on energy pills as well. So caffeine, focusing on, you know, Pretty much just energy but in different ways to intake it um so all in all just really focusing on innovation and how we can make consumers lives easier in a different and unconventional way but still being really responsible with how we do it sounds good sounds great <laughs> so you've been here uh at perennial for a year or so and and what what happened before that or how'd you get into the industry yeah so i started with perennial brands in february um right before COVID hit <laughs> But prior to this, I'm actually a professional makeup artist. Hmm. So I have went to school for cosmetic management and techniques. And I learned everything from, you know, theory to product development, marketing your business, um, entrepreneurship. So everything start to finish. And I really developed a love and a passion for product development. Hmm. And being a makeup artist, I was so exposed to what was in the industry and always just trying to keep up with what's new, what's innovative, what do I need to purchase? What do I need to be in the know of so that I can be able to service my clients and be, be like an industry expert? So as I was, you know, digging deep and deep, I saw, I think as of late, like 2019, people started talking about cannabis beauty. And I wasn't too vested in the cannabis category, but reading into it, it was really like, this is the next big thing. And it's not just a trend or a fad that lasted three months. It was like, no, no, this is really going to be the next thing for beauty. So I took a liking to it and really just started doing my research. But in Canada, I was like, I can't find anything. I can't find any CBD, any cannabis beauty products. But in the States, you know, at Nordstrom, like I see it everywhere. So I was so confused with why I couldn't get my hands on new, something so new and so exciting to me. So I started to dig a little bit deeper. And then um, I found perennial brands or we kind of found each other and they brought me on board to view cannabis more as a wellness product. Hmm. Um, and really just bring in a different perspective when you think of cannabis and beauty or cannabis with topicals, speaking to a different consumer. So though there is that cannabis consumer, how can we speak to, you know, your consumers that just want to live a healthy lifestyle and have an enhanced quality of life through, you know, skincare, through how like teas that they need to be drinking, beverages and stuff like that. So that's where I kind of 
uh, got really attached to is associating a lot with wellness versus just recreational. Mm -hmm. So I started with them and now we're just looking at launching some topicals in Canada and really just exploring new and innovative ways of how we can reach a cannabis consumer, but in a more responsible way, being a really trustworthy resource for them and hopefully doing the job at that. <laughs> So when you talk about uh, beauty and cannabis, you know, we've been working together on some packaging, your products. So that would be for, for face, for, you know, lip balms. Can you kind of talk about really what would beauty and cannabis be, you know, in terms of topicals? How, yeah. how would cannabis be uh, integrated into that? I think when we separate beauty and cannabis and when we try and bring them together, usually when people think beauty, they truly think like lipstick. Mm. And I try to really veer them off into what cannabis and what CBD can do for your skin. We know of all the amazing benefits and some of us have experienced the benefits of CBD when we ingest it, but what it does for our skin is very different and it's very unique as to other ingredients that are on the market, which is why I think it stands out so much. Um, so just a couple of benefits that it does offer for the skin, which more research is continuously being unveiled is that it's anti-inflammatory. So for people that go through any type of acne, irritation, rosacea, or eczema, it's proven and there's research to um, back up that it helps to calm that inflammation in the skin down. And it's really significant for someone that goes through a skin condition like rosacea to find something new that actually works and is still kind of being discovered. So mm -hmm. the products that we launch are really just focusing on enhancing wellness in your life. So whether that's on your skin and clearing acne or if it's helping you with your aging or if you even extend it to you know wellness as a whole so when you're taking care of yourself if you're taking a bath to relax and unwind can that cbd belong in a bath bomb can it be in a bath oil or is it something as simple as you know having a lip balm and throwing it on your lips and knowing that it's doing great things for your skin especially the winter in canada um, the dryness that we experience not only on our hands but on our lips and the way that CBD acts towards dryness and towards you know calming the skin down is why I'm so for lack of a better word, like I'm so obsessed with it because it's so life-changing for some people so mm -hmm. I just wanted to continue to pursue that and just find a way to speak to a beauty consumer but really talk to them about cannabis in the most approachable way without that stigma that it usually has. You know, that, that's great because if you're talking about beauty as I'm just going to put lipstick on to look mm. good, thinking about it in terms of wellness and helping people, you know, through, uh, you know, face conditions or something that it's more wellness, but it's still beauty because it's helping you live longer, feel better, uh, look better overall aging. I think that's great. Great position to be in. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not the same as, you know, throwing a red lipstick in that confidence, but it, it's really hard to understand if you haven't gone through it. So if someone has gone through like an insecurity on their skin, seeing that transformation, and I can speak from personal experience, I've come a long way with my skin. Um, the way that it transforms your confidence and over time, like maybe it's not an instant red lipstick, I feel great. But over time, you see that improvement, you see your skin getting better, you feel better, you look younger, like that is longer lasting and you're happier not instantly, but long term, which is what we really focus on is really making you feel beautiful without adding anything. We're just enhancing your natural beauty. And that's something that I'm really firm on. I um, is really just making people feel good about themselves with their own skin. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> well, I want to talk a, a bit about sustainability in the beauty industry. You know, you and I've talked about that numerous times. And we talked about it on kind of the group panel that we had. So talk about that sustainability in the beauty industry, uh, cannabis or not, where does it fit? Sustainability, I think, is picking up traction a lot in the beauty industry. It hasn't over the past couple of years, but I think it's really in hyperdrive now, and I think it needs to be. Um, beauty, unfortunately, has a big part to do in, you know, the damage that may be happening with the environment and seeing these brands or seeing the innovation that people can come up with to work towards sustainability is really important. And from a consumer perspective, but just as like a social responsibility. So when we look at sustainability and beauty, I think mainly people think about packaging, which is absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. So finding that primary packaging, but is there a necessary secondary packaging that you need? In that primary packaging, what is it? Like, is it a single use plastic that you're getting rid of right away? Is it something that you're able to recycle? 
Is it made from sustainable materials? And then extending that into your secondary packaging. So is something necessarily, like does it necessarily have to have that cardboard box on it? Or can you probably just sell the product without that cardboard box? So I think when you think about sustainability, people really opt for the packaging aspect, which I think is a huge, huge um, contributor to, you know, the environment. And but then when you, it's yeah. perceived as, as luxury if it's in a, in a package traditionally. Yeah, I think right? packaging is a huge motivator for consumers because the market is so saturated with beauty, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But now as packaging or as brands evolved, consumers will have the opportunity to shop more responsibly. So having sustainable options will be a better, having that assortment for them is going to be a better option for them but it is a huge motivator. People see a pretty package and there's some, you know, beauty is beauty, right? What's on the outside people love. So if they see a pretty package, they're more inclined to buy it. If that package is not necessarily a sustainable material, then it's really about balancing what your priority is. Like, do you want a pretty package or do you want to make sure that you're purchasing responsibly? And that is a constant battle towards consumers. So I think it's just really shifting them into your product is still going to function just as high, but, maybe you're going to be doing something a little bit better for the environment, a little bit more responsible as a consumer. You know, you were telling me about the ingredients kind of in the supply chain and what it takes to make some ingredients, you know, with the, the rose stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that doesn't seem sustainable <laughs> at all, actually. For sure. So another huge aspect of sustainability that consumers, I think, don't realize is almost like two combating terms of sustainability and natural. Um, and I know you and I have talked about this before, mm -hmm. but when consumers see the word natural, I think they automatically assume that it's better for the environment. And that's actually not always the case because it's an example that I always give. I believe the number is, yeah, so it takes about 242,000 rose petals to give five millimeters of distilled rose oil. Wow. So rose is one of the most common natural ingredients that's taken from the environment. and Though it is natural, there's a plain statistic right there that tells you you're doing a lot. You're taking a really big toll on the environment in order for that natural ingredient to be in your skincare. So natural doesn't always mean better, but oftentimes in the beauty industry, they're synonymous, mm -hmm. which I think is really an opportunity to educate your consumer of, you know, synthetic is not a bad word. Synthetic... Mm -hmm with the, how far technology is and how advanced we are specifically in the beauty industry. People are scared of the word synthetic, but don't realize that synthetic is often the more socially responsible and sustainable option because you're not doing as much damage to the environment um, as you would taking all of those 242,000 rose petals, right? So that's, it, that's I, totally I love seems like that. uh That's a huge point because people would say like, oh no, I'm not gonna use this ingredient. Oh, it's fake. I'm going to get yeah. the one that has all the, you know, the natural, but, it, and, and that's where it stops. There's, there's not, no more digging into it at all. And that's, yeah. that's probably, probably exists in a lot of products, you know, whether it's for beauty or not, the people would never know about what it takes to okay. actually make that. Yeah. And I think it's really about being transparent and for brands to communicate, you know, sustainability doesn't end in your packaging or it doesn't start with like, it starts with the products and the raw materials that you're using. So maybe you have the best sustainable primary and secondary packaging, but all of your ingredients to extract that, to the damage that you're doing doesn't really balance out the packaging that you're doing. And I think consumers are really starting to gain traction towards that and really just asking questions about their skincare. So I think progress is definitely being made, but it's still got quite a ways to go. Well, let's talk a little bit about greenwashing. You know, we, we've talked a lot about the industry in general. And, you know, we were talking with Melissa the other day about it. And it, it's a it's a big problem. So what is that? How do you see that from your uh, perspective in, within the beauty industry? And, and uh, just what's the status of now of greenwashing? Yeah, so greenwashing, it's, <laughs> it's very much present in the beauty industry. I think some brands use sometimes like a fear mongering terminology to entice their consumers to purchase their products. And it's really just about like what they're free from, if they're all natural, all organic and sustainable and clean. Clean is a really popular greenwashing term. What does that um, mean? Like if I saw a clean, 
Well, I, yeah. I so if you saw like, I, I need to have it. It's it's yeah. I mean, so a lot of re like a lot of major retailers are adapting to this clean strategy, and it's really just making sure that harmful chemicals are not in your skincare. Okay. Um, when you look at that from like a different perspective of what are a brand's intentions? A brand's intentions are to sell you products that work. So ultimately, they make money, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's come a long way from what clean beauty really means, which is, you know, responsible practices, natural ingredients, organic ingredients, even sometimes like vegan uh, products as well, that people associate anything that is not categorized as clean as bad. Huh. And clean or things like pretty much things like the term clean is an unregulated term. Oh. So anyone can claim that they're clean but there's really nothing to substantiate it unless they provide that uh, evidence to support it. So there is brands that can classify themselves as clean and can back up what they say with, you know, the emissions that they have at their facilities or their packaging or the ingredients that they're sourcing and providing feedback. So not to say that there isn't brands that are doing it right, but it's just there's brands that may be doing it wrong. And that's when that greenwashing comes into it into play where they're claiming that they're organic but can't back up what they're saying. And then from there evolves a fear towards, if it's not natural, I don't want it. Like if I can't, a really popular one, which I think is quite funny is like, if I can't pronounce the ingredient, it shouldn't be going on my face. And I'm like- right. So that would negate any <laughs> anything synthetic that's even, that is right? really good for you, right? I'm like, okay, then if you read the chemical makeup of an apple, like, does that mean you can't eat an apple? Like, it's it's hilarious. So it's, it's unfortunate. So it's important yeah. to educate, to make them feel, you know, secure when you are creating these synthetic ingredients. But there's a way to empower consumers to make a good decision, not scare them into it, which is something that I try to focus towards in our brands as well. So can you, how does organic come, come into play of sustainability and natural and clean? Is there think, a lot of organic in, in beauty industry? There is a lot of organic in the beauty industry. Um, again, it has to be supported with what, with what you're saying. Like you have to be able to support that your products are organic. Um, and it's really just making sure that there's no pesticides or no additional chemicals that are added into your ingredients. So mm. having that is, you know, a great option to search for if they are organic, but I would just empower or encourage consumers to really dig deep into brands that claim organic and can't back that up. Um, so it's definitely great to shop organic if you, if that's what your belief is and if that's what your um, preferences are when you are investing in products, but just make sure that you do your due diligence and just dig a little bit deeper because it'll only benefit you and educate you more. You know, I was working with a with a brand. Um, it was called Davinus, and this was mm -hmm. a while ago when I had my ad agency. And they they had all natural, organic, you know, ingredients, and it was it's a great product. And they got kind of accused of of greenwashing because they had some preservatives in there. Because mm -hmm. you know they're doing they're they're creating these in Parma, Italy, and they're shipping them all over the world. And they have to last, you know, up to a year or something like that. Yeah, for sure. And that, it was kind of a big controversy because they're like, look, you know, people would say, hey, if you're if you're organic, you have to be absolutely everything organic. You can't put anything else in there. And their perspective was, yeah, but it's, you know, it would spoil. And so and it seems like you have to have some sort of preservatives in there if you're going to go more than, you know, a couple of weeks or something like that. A hundred percent. It's preservatives are so like victimized in the industry, but people don't realize like how important a preservative is in your product. Like to have a shelf life for, you know, two weeks is, is not sustainable. Like that's just not a good practice to begin with. But when you think about if you're removing that preservative and those products, you know, build up bacteria or attract different molds, like that to me is more concerning than a preservative that is completely appropriate to put into your product. So I think, again, people love to like point fingers with what greenwashing is, but yes, you can use all natural. Yes, you can use organic, but how you preserve that is almost equally as important because those materials are so um, like pure, you need to make sure that you're taking care of them. So preservatives are absolutely mandatory, sorry, they're absolutely mandatory in your products. Now, what if you can't pronounce those? <laughs> So if you can't pronounce it, then that's okay. That's fine. <laughs> Just know that, do your research. Like they're, again, like they're, brands are not going to put a product on the market that is 
going to do terrible things for you, right? Like there is, I can't speak for all brands, but responsible brands or brands that are well recognized can make, you know, responsible decisions. Yep. If you can't read an ingredient, that's okay. Maybe just do a little bit of research, like learn about what the ingredient is or maybe why it's in that product. Like there's specific ingredients that need to be in that product that I can't pronounce, but I know that my product would not function as high or as efficiently if that ingredient wasn't in there. So I would say what just trust the process. Ended up doing, Davinus ended up just talking about it, you know, being transparent about what they are trying to do. You know, yeah. so they would say, yeah, this is organic. We're using these preservatives and here's what we're doing. And that's what we really found over the years is that when companies are trying and they're talking about it, then that's a huge benefit over a lot of mm -hmm. companies that they, they just don't even talk about it or they just say, oh, we're green or we're clean yeah. you know, without backing it up. So if you can provide the documentation, talk about what you're doing, try to improve a little bit every year, that's to me, uh, that seems the, the brands that are doing a good job are actually doing a good job because they're talking about it, not because of what it actually is inside. Yeah, exactly. You're building trust through education, not just like, you know, take my word for it. Look how great your skin looks. It's like, no, no, maybe you can't pronounce this ingredient and that's okay. But let me tell you why it's in here. And let me tell you, this is needed in order to make your rose oil for whatever reason, function the way that you love it to, or you love hyaluronic acid. We need this ingredient that you can't pronounce in order for your hyaluronic acid to function properly. So every brand that is able to educate and um, build consumers knowledge and trust is definitely going to continue to dominate. Because as consumers become more aware, they are able to make more conscious decisions now that they know. So when you talk about being more conscious, you know, what can consumers do if they're just going through, you know, the shelves somewhere and they see all these brands, it gets overwhelming, can't pronounce things, there's clean, there's all these things. What can a consumer do to be to buy something that actually is sustainable in the beauty industry, possibly with or without cannabis or CBD? Yeah. So... I mean, with CBD in your products, there's a whole other, there's almost like a different process because you want to look for like certificate of analysis to ensure that your product has passed its test, that it's safe for you to use and that you feel confident um, and it's approachable for you to start using. In when you speak about sustainability with your products and especially with CBD products, you want to figure out where your products are coming from. How is the CBD sourced or how is it extracted? Is that something that you align your values with is that the type of CBD that you want to be taking. But when you are shopping or you're overwhelmed by how many options there are, what I would really encourage consumers to start doing is to just pause what you're doing, look a little bit past what like the pretty pictures and dig a little bit deeper into the brand, like your brand website. If a brand is doing great things, they definitely want to share the great things that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So just read about their ingredients, read about, you know, their packaging, and really analyze, like, do you need this or not? I think often, and I, I can totally say that I'm guilty for this. I love to buy new things when I don't need anything, when I'm not done anything. And that's the number one way that you can be sustainable is like, you don't need to purchase 15 different cleansers, like mm -hmm. three different cleansers. Like what works for you works for you. And however you want to spend your money is, you know, not my place, but a more sustainable behavior is really like, do I have anything at home that would do this? Is mm. this really something that's missing in my life that I want to incorporate? Because mm. ultimately the more sustainable option is less waste. Right. Or if you're able to, you know, if it's a single use product, a lot of brands are coming out with solid shampoo bars um, that are packaged in compostable packaging. Like if you're deciding between those two factors, consider, you know, having that social responsibility and thinking about sustainability. And though it's, a small purchase that may be a ten dollar shampoo bar, it could be going like it could be going a long way. And just know that consumers have that power to make that decision and to do better things towards the environment. So just a couple things to consider before they purchase is really just slow down and just ask questions. So if you're a brand on you know on on the other side, what can brands do? They can educate. They can be transparent. What do you see in for what brands that are being successful? in educating the consumer? I think that's the number one thing is just really educating your consumers. And if you don't have, you know, a solid sustainability plan, then, or if you're not 
necessarily as sustainable as you want to like educate your consumers on what you're working towards so they can trust that they're in good hands and they're putting their money towards something that's really giving back and not just a brand that's on the market for no reason with no intention. Mm -hmm. So from a brand, like I think a lot of brands are doing fantastic. Like Nordstrom is recently partnered with TerraCycle to do a recycling program. Estee Lauder, I think has uh, achieved net zero emissions Mm -hmm. um, in some of their, um, sorry, factories. And then we also have, I don't even know, there's a lot. I know mm-hmm. Youth to the People is one of my favorite skincare brands right now, just because their number one focus is being sustainable, but the quality of their products is fantastic. And they actually show consumers how they can repurpose their packaging, which I think is awesome because it's one thing to say we're sustainable. This is packaging that can live with you forever. But it's another thing to be like, look at how we can do this. Look at how our packaging relives. Like this can also double as like you can put your hand soap in here, you can put flowers in here, like whatever you want. Um, but I think from a brand perspective, just revisiting their current processes, there's a lot of focus on, you know, what they do after. And, you know, all of our products are recyclable, like you can, any any type of like compostable or anything like that, but also how they give back. Mm-hmm. But then when you take it to the other side of the supply chain, it's like, what are you doing in the first place to prevent the post-consumer purchase action that needs to happen. So is it really just being a little bit more proactive versus reactive, in my opinion? And there's definitely brands that are adapting that. I think sustainability is a conversation in every single skin or skincare and beauty brand. So I think it's really coming a long way. COVID was a little bit of a setback just with, you know, wipes and people yeah. using like makeup wipes and all that stuff. But I think it's really headed in a great direction. So I'm really excited to see what comes out of it. Um, but I encourage brands and even, you know, developing a brand myself is really just questioning myself and figuring out what we can do before we even have a post consumer program or recycling program, what we can do in the first place Mm. to make sure that we're setting them up for success and we're giving them resources, we're giving them options to shop so that we're able to give them that decision. So and I think that's something that you and I partner with. And the reason why I love working with you is because you're very passionate about it. And so am I. I'm like, how can we work together to create a product that's responsible from the start? And then our consumers can enjoy knowing that the products that they're purchasing are a responsible choice as well. It's a it's a great point there. And 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 thanks for that. The um, you know, when you talk about reuse, it's an interesting conversation. If you remember James uh, from CMG was talking about it's a, it's a bit counterintuitive because companies want to just sell more. So really what we're saying is, no, you need to be advocating for your brand for people to buy less because you can reuse yeah. the package. But right? by, by that position, the thought is, is that you will get a lot more users because you are being responsible yeah. as opposed to just one use and you sell it over and over again say, no, think about this. And that drives users to your brand. And I do think that's changing. I I think that's changing rapidly now when people say, okay, I'm going to buy this when it's over, when the topical is done, I'm going to use it for something else. But because they, you know, talk about that, I love the brand. And then I'm going to go buy more or even take that package back to some places that have a refillable program. Yeah, the refill program, for sure. And just by that, even though you're not selling the package, so there isn't that margin on there, you are selling more product. Yeah, exactly. And even like like you were saying, with, with someone sharing that belief or sharing a love for that product, maybe they don't need to buy it as frequently, but because they love the product, they trust the product that they're being responsible, they may end up buying it for three of their friends. Right. Right. Yeah, and it just kind of goes it, from there. You know, those kind of referrals and, and there's a lot of brand loyalty, I think. Yeah. In, in that and it comes to like what the brand really stands for. Like if you believe in what the brand stands for, that will take you so, so far. Great. That's awesome. Well, tell me uh, how people can get a hold of you and uh, uh, really the website you know, to learn more about your company. Yeah, for sure. So if anyone wants to reach out to the website, it's www.perennialbrandsinc.com. And it'll give you some insight into all three of our businesses, including the Canavate business that we currently have. So I encourage everyone to uh, reach out. There is an info email there as well, if anyone wants to reach out to me. Or you can reach out to me at samantha.marchioni at perennialbrandsinc.com. And I'm happy to help out with anything else. 
Can you spell that? The, your, oh, your... yes. <laughs> so it's Samantha. It's S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A -A -A dot M-A-R-C-H-I-O-N-E at P-E-R-E-N-N-I-A-L brands, Inc. So I-N-C dot com. Perfect. A little bit of a lengthy one. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So what are you looking most forward to in terms of a launch in the next 12 months for what you're working on? Next 12 months, I would definitely say our topical products. I'm super excited for just the research and the development that we have behind uh, our products with the teams that we use. I'm just so excited because I know the market hasn't really seen anything like that. Not only the cannabis market, but even the beauty market as well. So to be able to use products that I've been so intrigued about and just get the benefits that I've been learning about and experiencing with products that, you know, are our own. I'm just, I can't wait. 2021 is going to be awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for your time and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben.